The story of Umberto goes back to my dad, Jim, James Walker. Big Jim, as my pals used to call him when I was at school. He used to have these big, big arms, truck driver. And me and my brothers used to try and hang off his arms. He's a right character, my dad. I get on really well with him. And, and he's always, you know, my name's Robert Walker. Full name's Robert Walker. And uh, people call me Rob. And, but my dad's always called me Umberto. So if I phone up all, and my mum says, you know, who is it? Up phone. It's Umberto. And it's just, yeah, I'm Umberto. And I've been Umberto, I think, since about five. I don't really know exactly, but as long as I can remember. Grew up in a place called Shelf, which is in between Halifax and Bradford. And I was born in 77 and it was cold. The winters were quite severe. I didn't play with my brothers so much. Um, they were sort of off, nearly always off doing their own thing. And I looked a bit weirdly being in really scruffy clothes, going on my mountain bike, getting covered in mud and just being really free and liberated. Um, that's how it felt. So we'd make tree swings over um, like streams. So it was just wonderful. I'd be down there with our friends all on his bikes, just having a lot of fun. Um, so that was a big, that feels like a really big side to my childhood and my happiness. And the other side was Lego. I was obsessed with Technic Lego. My parents at the time, they didn't, have, they didn't seem to have a great deal of money, but yet they always made sure that I had the Technic Lego that I'd hoped for for Christmas every Christmas, and I don't know how they did it really with four boys. I was so proud of them for that. I've got a very early memory um, of drawing, and it's etched in my mind. My memory seems to work like that really. I'll zone in on small details uh, throughout my life really, and my dad has always been obsessed with the Navy and ships. He had a lot of like ships in bottles around the dining room, which my mum would despair at. You know, my mum's my mom, got a particular style of interior design. Um, and whereas my dad, I always wanted to make the house either look like a pub or a Navy museum on both, the mixture of the two. And I distinctly remember taking this ship in a bottle off the kind of sideboard, and putting it in front of me on the dining room table, which was always there. We always ate around it. And I started drawing. And I don't think I had a ruler, but I thought to myself, I thought, um, so, so the ship of the bottle had, had, had a wooden base at the bottom and then, and then, this, and then this bottle, so there were, there were a lot of kind of parallel lines. And, I, and weirdly, funnily enough with the Lego and stuff, looking back, it seemed really important to me to get these parallel lines right and to get them, you know, perpendicular if you like. And I didn't have a ruler, so I used the edge of a book. And I've basically sort of scrabbled around in the top of the drawer, which was full of odds and sods, and I found a pencil, I found a bit of a rubber, and I found enough of what I needed to draw this ship in a bottle. And I drew it, and I felt really proud of it, and I, and I felt really excited about, um, I feel emotional now. Tell him, show him my dad. And he got home from work. Oh God, that's really surprised me, is that? Um, and that's the earliest memory of drawing. You felt really proud. got a very clear early memory which I think shaped all of my schooling and shaped my confidence through my 20s. That memory is junior school, everybody in the school being asked a question and this was, this was I would have been in infants now and this, this, this question was, was asked, uh, do, you know, do you know the answer to this? And I, I felt like I did know the answer to it but I was too frightened to put my hand up because I felt um, I didn't want anybody to laugh at me if I, if I got the answer wrong. So I didn't put my hand up. Somebody else did, they answered it. And I remember feeling absolutely shattered, you know, and disappointed with myself that I, didn't, that I hadn't put my hand up because I knew I did know the answer, but it was just perhaps that I didn't have that confidence to do that. Now, I can remember all that changing on a moment when suddenly I started to make all the class laugh by 
acting silly, basically. Um, and, I, and in that moment, and I can still see myself doing it, I can still see the reactions from everybody. I thought, I've got everybody in the palm of my hand here. And I think that was a, a, such an, an enormous impact on me at that time that it shaped the rest of my schooling. You know, I left school with two GCSEs. And I left school with two GCSEs because I was too frightened to put my hand up in fear of getting the answer wrong. Those GCSEs were a C in art, which I was lucky to get, and a D in craft design technology, which I was lucky to get. That was one of the most depressing days of my life, the day that I got those GCSE results, because I left, left school with sort of thinking, holy hell, what am I gonna do now with this? Because my, my sort of um, confidence got had obviously hit in rock bottom. A bit of a tricky period, I left home at quite a young age, I was 17. That was a really, really hard point in my life and had a year or two on the dole sort of thing. Very unhappy really. Um, and then sort of pulled out of that and got a job as a postman. I only lasted four weeks, I absolutely hated it. Back then, you know, you could get the jobs paper and look, look, in, look in the paper and, and find a job, you know. And and I, and I got this, did my first proper job as a, as a picture framer, bespoke picture framer. And, and I absolutely loved that job, you know. So I became a guild commended picture framer, registered with a fine art trade guild in London. I just found it so interesting. I was doing something with my hands, I was using my head, but it was very creative. But things changed within that field quite a bit. And I did it for about five years and then I got out. I started to sort of have many years kind of working in retail in one capacity or another. And I'd always been working actively as an artist but I always had a full-time job. Now, I exhibited as a painter uh, in Tokyo, uh, London. I had these successful exhibitions, but exhibited my work, but I always worked full-time jobs. I just could not take that leap financially. I wasn't confident enough to do that and didn't see it as something that you could do, really. So I went to work at this school, big Muslim community of Huddersfield. I was a technician in a DT department and I just fell in love with teaching. And suddenly I, I realized I was in love with learning and I, I, I never realized it before. And I loved the kids, they were rough diamonds. They really were. Um, some were really naughty boys, you know, but there was something about them that I loved. And I learned so much. I learned a lot about myself. I learned a lot about somebody else's faith and I learned a lot about respect um, and I learned a lot from those children. I really did. But this was in my twenties and I was still stuck in this period, uh, uh, confidence wise, of, of, of genuinely thinking I was too stupid to go to university. And uh, it was a different sort of person that went to university and I wasn't one of them. And um, I had a, a, uh, a line manager, Eleanor Ball, and she spotted something in me, uh, which I didn't know was there myself. And she said, you know, you'd be a good teacher. And she, cut a long story short, she, encouraged me every step of the way to apply for university, go to university and become a teacher. And I applied for a BA, I was terrified. And when I got to the university, they offered me an MA. And so I bypassed the BA, went straight in at an MA. And, and that completely frazzled my mind, did that. Um, because I'd, I'd literally more or less overnight gone from thinking I was too stupid to go to university to then being offered a master's because I'd all, because I've been a practicing artist and designer and illustrator for the best part of 10 or 15 years, but not really acknowledged that within myself as such. And so this person encouraging me to go to university had suddenly then opened up this whole other door in my life, really. Um, so I, I did my MA, did my PGCE. That was wonderful, was that course. Uh, very inspiring. Did my teacher training at Leeds College of Art. I then became a lecturer with Wakefield College. I then became course leader at Wakefield College. This was all within four years. And I then became senior lecturer at Leeds College of Art. So from, from hang on a minute, uh, from 2010 to 2016, I'd gone from two GCSEs to becoming senior lecturer of a university. So I would exp feel extremely proud about that. On a Sunday, we'd, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't go to church. My mum and dad would sit and listen to records. And my dad would have, have about 2,007 inches 
all in new, numerical order, all written down in books. And he'd say to me, Umberto, go get 212. So I'd go up to his wardrobe and I'd pick out 212 and it'd be Blondie um, or it'd be, um, I don't know, Bob Seger, if, if it were my mum. Uh, she loved Bob Seger. And, um, and, I, and I've now got those records at home. What I kind of really remember the most culturally is the 80s. So things like Banana Armour and, and bands like that and Madonna and, and now I look back at it, look back at those times with such affection. I did so much at the time. I always wanted to do the indie thing and the underground thing, the thing that wasn't on top of the pops. You know, I, I started school in 88. This is high school, in 88. I kind of liked the cool kids, you know what I mean? The cool kids, in my book, listened to the underground stuff. The people that introduced me to that music was my cousin, Edward. Now, Edward had an older brother, Matthew. And Matthew, I just thought was, the bomb when I was a kid because he had this massive Mohican and he just looked the, he just looked incredible. He was a full on punk, but then he went into sort of new romantic kind of goth sort of stuff. Now, Matthew and Edward did me a mixtape in the sort of early nineties um, and passed it on to my auntie who used to come up and babysit me and she passed it on to me and on there was Cud, um, Average White Band, um, Iggy Pop, there were a couple of Blue Note jazz tracks on there as well, like Hank Mobley, The Flip, I'll never ever forget that. So, so just some incredible bands were all on this tape. And that tape influenced me beyond belief. So like, so he got me into Cud, never saw Cud on top of Pops, but you'd see it maybe on, uh, or, you, or you'd hear it um, on, say, John Peel. Who've been described in the press as grubby Leeds uh, funsters, which just about sums it up. And the A side of their new single, which is Slack Time. I used to spend my sort of lessons at school trying to draw the Cud logo, which was typographic and is still etched in my mind as, a, as an incredible iconic logo. And the U is like some others. It's an amazing logo. Um, and I used to try and draw that and I could never get it right. You know, it was a hard logo to draw. And so there was this sort of like draw it, drawing the logos, recognizing the graphic design, recognizing the visual language of the music packaging feeling this tactile thing of like pulling a record out from its sleeve. So you've got the artwork, then you've got the sleeve. Final just to me was just one of the most creative things I've ever, I've ever kind of come across. And then the music within that is, an, is this in, immense emotive art form in its own right. You know, in times when I've been a student, I've been far too drunk on nights out, I've had my top off, I've been writhing around on the floor. And some of these people, rightly or wrongly, I've admired that and liked that energy. So from these friends, I've, en I've ended up um, forming my own band with them called Steve Albino and the Love Socks, <laughs> which, is, which I'm the front man of. Two thousand and ten, because we, we used to go out quite a lot then. That was when I was doing my MA, and so. But then, you know, it always seemed like a great idea when you're all sort of drunk or you're all a bit merry, and everybody's in the same place. But then in the sober, cold light of day, the thought of it is absolutely terrifying, especially with the kind of concept of it as well. Like, what well, actually going on stage topless? Like, no, it just seemed weird. But, you know sort of four years, five years later, we actually did get it together. And it blew people away, it really did. It was crazy, crazy, crazy thing. And what did she say? What did she say? And what did she say? What did she say?
Ben Warbanks on drums, we've got Chris Raffoni on guitar, we've got Andrew Lasdins on guitar, myself as the front man. Those guys all cross-dress, so that's sort of this visual language that we've got, so that's like a given that they all kind of wear, wear something like that. I go on stage nearly always topless in gold, <laughs> gold tight pants or whatever. So it's become this kind of like, this art form and this performance. I'm not a singer, well I don't think I am anyway. So I scream and, and do all this sort of stuff and rive around. But people love it and it's become this kind of, we've only done like a handful of gigs and we've always done them on Halloween. So it's become this kind of like horror, psychobilly, horribilly, rockabilly sort of amalgamation. And what feels so nice about that is that I'm there with, these people that have come into my life through this music and through these art forms. We're all extremely creative individuals, but we're all extremely tight friends. They're all intelligent people, but also so open and willing to let the hair down and see that as, as something to learn from, you know, in life. And it's beautiful being on stage with them. <laughs> And then myself and my wife decided to have uh, children, decided to start a family. And so then Reuben came along and, you know, funny things happen when you, when you, when you become a parent. Like, you know, emotions start coming out that you didn't know were there really. And one thing that I struggled with, and I still do a little bit, was, was that, that Iggy Pop character there, you know, being a responsible, you know, loving dad and husband. And I thought I, I couldn't be that and that at the same time, which is absolute nonsense. That person on stage being Steve Albino is, is no different to the person at home helping his son with his homework or giving him emotional support. You know, and I was thinking, you know, that, that I, I don't know, I just didn't want people to see me in that light really. And I didn't want, I didn't want sort of Ruben to feel embarrassed about his dad being like that. But I squared it with myself and I did this gig after many years apart from the band and we did this gig and Ruben saw a little bit of footage of me on, on YouTube, I think it was, or somewhere. And, uh, and he started doing impressions of me, but in quite a nice way where he was sort of like, he was on the rug, like in the living room, like it was his little stage. He was saying, look, I'm being daddy. And, and he was sort of to, almost a bit like Dougal out of Father Ted, sort of giving it kind of, you know, like Elvis, <laughs> really funny. And then sort of playing his guitar, but kind of going like this. And it was just really sweet. And, and I thought, but it's basically I've been giving myself too much of a hard time about being that person on stage, when really I needed to accept that that was a very, it is still a very creative output. that's fundamental to who I am. It's a form of expression. So what if I've got my top off? So what, does that make me a bad father? No, it doesn't at all. A bad son? No, it doesn't at all. Um, yeah, it's, so Steve Albino sort of, he's still in existence, but you know, it'll come back around. It'll come back around. I, I, can, I can feel it sort of somehow, don't know why, but I, I feel like I can feel it sort of somehow getting back together. <laughs> And, and so eventually I became a senior lecturer in a role that I thought was going to be, you know, the cherry on the cake. That was where I want to be. That is that role that I want to have. Uh, I felt like I'd, I'd, you know, I'd achieved my full goal. And I felt very uh, proud to have become a teacher, especially sort of with the like, educational background that I'd had. What I feel, I became, you know, really good at my job. I was very passionate about it and I was very, very passionate about helping the students and I would do anything for them. And I, I kept feeling like, right, I need to do that, I need to go there, I need to meet them, I need to do that, I need to take them there, and this will help my career as well. And, and I didn't like that, I started to really dislike that in myself, and eventually I started to feel like I didn't recognise who I was anymore, that I was becoming so conscious of even to the point of what I was wearing, because it didn't fit with the kind of 
what a graphic designer wears or what a graphic designer looks like or it didn't fit with it wasn't professional enough for a teaching role and I really did start to feel like I didn't know who I was and that thought of Steve Albino was like who's he you know and I became quite unwell mentally because of that really you know becoming quite paranoid about having your paperwork in on time you know becoming extremely stressed with uh, the pressures of grades and targets and if Billy is gonna pass or if Billy is gonna get XYZ mark and what effect that's gonna have on Billy's life, even if Billy didn't deserve to pass or hadn't done the work, you know. But I think my um, history with education was affecting my, the way that I looked at that greatly, you know, I felt a lot of pressure to, to give them the, try to give them the best that they could, that they could have really. Uh, but while still retaining a sense of self within myself, you know. Again, I'd, 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 I'd gone so far down this path that I just did not recognise myself. At home, at work, with my friends, I, I, I just don't sound like me, I don't feel like me. And I, th I guess, try and cut a long story short, I think what people might label it as is a breakdown, you know. I became agoraphobic um, just over a period of Christmas on my son's third birthday um, and I couldn't sleep and sort of got my heart broken a little bit really with, with, with my personal experiences of, of the sort of teaching educational sector and, um, and I just knew that basically I couldn't leave the house and I couldn't go up to that building. I could not walk up to that building and carry on being who I was because I no longer recognised the words that were coming out of my mouth or the thoughts that I was having or I just didn't know who I was anymore. That's how it felt. But what ended up being very beautiful about that kind of breakdown was that this light bulb moment of signs by Umberto, you know, sign writing. I started sign writing when I was 14, doing my work experience, painting large, murals at the Eureka Children's Museum in Halifax for Brian the Brush, who still works out of Bradford uh, as a sign writer. From having that light bulb moment, I just instantly started researching, couldn't sleep. And I was, I was looking through these books, all on type, found this whole world there still working as sign writers. You know, it, they'd never died off with it, even, even when the vinyl kicked in in the 90s. And I found all these people that just became so, so inspirational. And when I found the work, I, you know, I was almost in tears, you know, that these people were doing all of these things that I'd actually wanted to, that I should have done really, 20 years earlier. And so it, ju it just felt like, you know, um, Someone was shining a light in my eyes and, and going, this is the path. This is what you need to do for you and for your mental health, for your family, um, and for Umberto, for you, who you are, Robert. You need to go and pick up a brush and start painting again. So, I, sign writing feels like, I don't know, if you cut me in half, that's what it would say, sign writer, sign writing, whatever. And, Something that I felt very proud about when I was painting was that I was able to load a brush up with paint just instinctively like it had the right amount on the, the brush and the bristles to pull a particular length of line of paint and I could block out colour to a point where it looked like a print so you couldn't see any brush strokes. And I knew I had to do all this instinctively. This was sort of self-taught just from understanding the materials. And for me, as an individual, understanding material that I work with with my hands is who I am. And I don't know what it does. Well, I do know what it does. It tops up my soul. That's what it does. It makes me feel alive. And if I notice something that that paint's doing in that particular way, or the brush is doing in that particular way, I just feel alive, I get so excited by that. And that's what sign writing does for me. And I don't know why, but that's what lettering does for me. You know, doing that as a sign writer and loading up, you know, loading up a brush with paint. One moment, you know, you can be building a frame, you know, for a sort of swing sign, and then you can be glossing it up and try to get as neat a finish as possible. And then you can be constructing the lettering and then you can be filling it in. It's sort of, it's all the things that I'm interested in coming together in one place. Now I came across Dave Smith's work in 2012, 
showing my students the making of this, the album cover Born and Raised by John Mayer for Sony Records. It's on Vimeo and I nearly cried when I saw that because I saw this person doing this craft at such a high level with such dexterity and honesty. It was just a beautiful, beautiful film. Well, that's, you know, I, that's how I felt at the, at the time. And uh, yeah, I thought, wouldn't it be wonderful to be able to do that? And then when I left teaching, I was lucky enough to be able to go to Dave's studio and learn that craft and meet the man himself who's become a friend in my eyes and a wonderful mentor. I really respect what Dave's done. Dave has brought back from near extinction certain techniques within uh, glass sign work, okay? And he has put his heart and soul and a great deal of expense, financial expense, mental expense, into learning that craft so that others, so that one, he stays alive, but others can learn it as well. And I'd like to carry that on, mainly, if I'm really honest, to the best of my ability, because it, it, if, if anything, he, he's topped up my soul to a, to, to a level that I could never sort of imagine. And I'd like to try and be able to do that for other people. I'd like people to be able to try and come to this studio and perhaps talk about this craft, learn this craft from myself. And I'm still learning a lot, but as I learn, I'll be able to pass that on to, to others, hopefully, and be able to kind of continue to pursue making signs specifically out of glass with gold that are contextually historically correct but that are contemporary in a manner that inspires other people that they want they want to learn that so the sign writing doesn't die never will die it'll continue to grow and grow and grow and i'll continue to grow as a person and i can help other people grow as individuals as well and i just i'd like to be respected in some respects really in, in that in that field um and I'd like to continue to put into it so that I feel like I'm respecting myself as well and I'm respecting my um, creative outputs. I haven't always sort of respected my own work. Sometimes I look at it and I'm very critical with it. I don't feel like this with this. It feels just just wonderful. If I, if I won the lottery today, I'd still make glass signs because it's amazing. And, and also sort of decided to call the business signs by Umberto. Again, it was this sort of like returning to something that was solid. You know, my dad's called me that since, since the day I can remember, you know, being five or whatever. And it's like, I don't know, maybe it was a sort of sense of, you know, I had my family by my side, both in terms of my name, and I had my new family, as in my wife and my son, right by my side, but you know, my wife's absolute rocked with me, you know, she, she, she anchors me and, they were there sort of behind me and those memories were behind me to go, you can make this happen. You know, and if you're passionate enough about it, you'll work 24 seven to make this work. And that's what I have done, you know. What's the dream job? The dream job I think would be, you know, a commission from somebody like, um, like Manchester Museum or the v &A, you know. I don't know, something where, you know, somebody had the budget create quite a large piece where I could throw into that piece lots of different techniques that I've spent time perfecting and learning that has some longevity you know so that my son might be, might go to a museum when he's a pensioner and say my dad did that you know yeah <laughs>